Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video series where we talk a lot about results we have for so-called Fourier series. And indeed, in today's part 19, we will talk about the proof of the pointwise convergence theorem we have for Fourier series. In particular, it tells us under which conditions and at which points the Fourier series converges to the original function. However, before we state the theorem again, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget that you can use the link in the description to download additional material. And then I would say we can immediately start talking about the topic of today. So for a given L2 function, which is also 2 pi periodic, we fix a point x hat in our interval from minus pi to pi. For example, we could choose x hat as the origin and then f could look like this. And there you already see, we don't need to be continuous at the point x hat, but some limits need to exist. On the one hand, if we approach the function from the left hand side, the limit has to exist. And if we approach the function from the right hand side, the limit also has to exist. And on the other hand, we also want to have existence for the slopes when we approach x hat as well from right and left. And there I should emphasize again, we don't need any equalities of the values, we just need the existence of these four limits. And indeed, this is all we need such that we can say something about the pointwise convergence of the Fourier series at the point x hat. And as always, the Fourier series is called fnf, and at the point x hat, we send n to infinity. And what we get is exactly the middle point between the two values we get at the jump point x hat. So in the picture above, this would be exactly the point here. And in order to make our notation a little bit simpler, let's call this middle point capital M. Okay, very well, this is our theorem and now we want to prove it. And there you might already know, what we need is the Dirichlet kernel from the last video. It's usually denoted by dnx and it's a continuous function on R and it can be written with these sine functions here. And there please note that the zeros in the denominator don't make any problems because we can extend this formula continuously even at these points. And now the good thing is that we can use this Dirichlet kernel to rewrite our Fourier series of f at the point x hat in a short formulation. Namely it's just the inner product, the L2 inner product of dn with f where f is shifted by this x hat in that sense. And moreover, we can also apply the n to any constant function with the inner product as well. However, in this case it's quite simple because what comes out is just the constant again. And now as a reminder, we can sketch the graph of the n again from minus pi to plus pi. And there you should see that we have an even function, so we always have the symmetry with respect to the y-axis. And exactly this symmetry we can use to make our life a little bit simpler when we want to calculate this inner product. So you might already guess, instead of the integral from minus pi to plus pi, we can just take two times the integral from zero to pi. So let's see how we can manage that, because we have to transform a little bit. So first we have our integral from minus pi to plus pi, and we integrate with respect to x. Hence, as already mentioned, we can split that up into two parts. Indeed, such a splitting always works, but now we want to bring them back together. Therefore, we just substitute minus x with a new variable called y. By doing that, the first integral also goes from 0 to plus pi. Moreover, we can also use our symmetry of dn, because dn of y is the same as dn of x. In short, an even function does not care about a minus sign. However, inside the function f it matters, so there is the difference between the left integral and the right integral. But this is not a big problem, because we can still put them together and write them as one integral again. And there inside we just have f of x hat plus y and f of x hat minus y. So you see the whole formulation is not shorter than our original, but it makes everything simpler soon, because we only have to integrate from 0 to pi here. This matters because, as already mentioned, the zero, the origin, is a zero of the denominator of the Dirichlet kernel. Hence now the special point is at the border of the integral, so it does not make many problems. Okay, with that we are ready to start our calculation of the pointwise limit. 
For example, we could just calculate the difference between f and f and m. And if this difference goes to zero for n to infinity, we know that this pointwise limit is exactly equal to m. Hence, this is exactly what we want and now we can put in all our formulas from before. Namely, the Fourier series can be written using the Dirichlet kernel and also the constant m in that way. And now we know the first one is given by an integral and the second one as well. However, obviously the second integral is much simpler because for a constant function, both parts here are exactly the same. In other words, we can just write two times m. And of course, there we can use the definition of m, which was given as the sum of the limits of f at x hat. So we just have f of x hat plus and f of x hat minus. And then obviously in the next step, we want to write everything in just one integral. And there it's already useful to put f of x hat plus y together with f of x hat plus. Hence we have the difference of that part plus the difference of the minus parts. So it already looks quite nice and there the only thing missing is just the definition of our Dirichlet kernel. And there, as you might remember from before, the numerator was given as sine of n plus one half times y. And moreover, the denominator was quite simple because it was just given as sine of one half y. And there the crucial idea is to break the Dirichlet kernel apart such that we only have to consider this function on the right hand side. And in order to make our notation shorter, let's call this function g of y. And obviously our function g is also 2 pi periodic and well defined with the exception points given by this sine function again. However, as always, these exception points don't matter in the integral, so you can define it however you want at these exception points. And now we can see what happens if we have the nice property for g that it is an L2 function. Indeed, for L2 functions we already know a lot when we talk about Fourier series. And just to be clear, here what we could do is to define g with this formula inside the interval from 0 to pi and 0 elsewhere. And then as always we can just extend it to pi periodically. So keep that in mind when we talk about the L2 function g here, because what only matters is the interval from 0 to pi. And now the question is, can we say something about that integral in this nice case? And indeed it's not complicated at all, because the sine function here is just given by exponential functions as always. To be precise, it's 1 over 2 pi i times the exponential function of i times this number. And then we have minus the same just with the minus sign in the exponent. And there you should see, we can split it up that we have e to the power i n y and e to the power minus i n y. In other words, here we just multiply a given function to our important exponential function and the same on the right. And at this point you should recognize that together with the integral we just have our calculation formula for Fourier coefficients. And moreover, we can also explicitly write down the functions inside the integral for the Fourier coefficients. And then we see the first part is e minus n with a function g1. And for the second part we would have e plus n for a function we could call g2. And there it's not a big problem at all to write down the explicit definitions of the functions g1 and g2. However, it's not strictly necessary because we immediately see that g1 and g2 are L2 functions as well because they are just combined with exponential functions and the function g. Hence having L2 functions is the big thing here. The reason for that is that we already know what happens to the Fourier coefficients of a given L2 function if we send n to infinity. In fact, this is what we know from Bessel's inequality. Namely, the complex Fourier coefficients always go to zero if we send n to plus or minus infinity. This thing we have explicitly discussed in part 8 of the series. So we conclude here, in the case that g is an L2 function, then we already know that the whole thing here tends to zero when n goes to infinity. And please recall, this is exactly what we wanted to prove from the beginning, in that case we are done. Or in other words, the only thing remaining to show is that this function g is an L2 function. However, there we already know that f is an L2 function, so f is quite nice, so the numerator does not make any problems. 
The only thing that could happen is that the sign function in the denominator makes everything explode. But also this can only really happen at zero or around zero because everything else is quite nice for the sign function as well. So the first step we do here is to split up the function again into the two parts that matter. And again as a reminder this first definition only holds in the interval from zero to plus pi. And there we see again we don't have any problems if we go outside a neighborhood of zero because there we just have our function f which is an L2 function. So the only question is does gy explode when we go with y to zero from the right hand side. Hence we have to consider the sine function of one half y when we approach zero. However this one we can quickly estimate by a linear function because the derivative of the sine function at zero is strictly positive. Therefore we just have to choose a smaller slope and that's all we need. For example one quarter times y is definitely smaller than this sine function. And with that we can just estimate each part in the function g separately. So for example the first part here we can estimate in the absolute value when we just put one quarter times y in the denominator. Which simply means we can pull out a factor of four. And that's already it because now we can send y to zero on the right hand side. And there you see inside the absolute value we have the slope of f at x hat when we come from the right hand side. Hence the result here is four times this constant that exists and we can call it c plus. Indeed it does not matter what the constant actually is because we just want that the function does not explode and it does not explode because we reach a finite value here. And again to make it clear our assumption is that this limit exists and we can call it c plus. However then in our limit above we should rather write c plus in the absolute value. And now it might not surprise you that we can do exactly the same thing for the second part. And this is quite simple because we can copy everything from before. The only difference is now that we subtract y in the numerator which means we approach our slope of f from the left hand side. However again we still have the existence of that slope and let's call it c minus. Indeed the only difference in our definition was that the limit has an h smaller than zero here which means we approach our slope from the left hand side. And that's it because both slopes exist as finite numbers our function g cannot explode. In other words g is bounded in a neighborhood around zero and therefore it's an L2 function. And this finishes our proof for the pointwise convergence of Fourier series. However we are still not finished with our discussion about Fourier series so I would say we should meet in the next video again. So have a nice day and bye bye. Mm -hmm.